Welcome back. You're watching To The Point and to the second part of a special exclusive interview with K. Natwar Singh on his autobiography, One Life Is Not Enough. Yesterday he spoke at length for the first time about the dramatic revelations in his autobiography about Congress President Sonia Gandhi. Tonight we shall talk about the revelations concerning her husband Rajiv Gandhi. Remember, Mr. Natwar Singh served for, four, five, for full five years as the minister in Rajiv Gandhi's government right through the period Rajiv Gandhi was Prime Minister. Mr. Natwar Singh, let's start first with the Sri Lanka adventure and the IPKF, which many people believe was possibly one of Rajiv Gandhi's greatest debacles. You write, he was in a great hurry to find a solution for the ethnic problems in Sri Lanka. Perhaps it was his successful handling of the Punjab and Assam crises which had given him confidence. However, and this is very important, Rajiv Gandhi was not familiar with the history of the ethnic problems in Sri Lanka. So was he making a terrible mistake to be in a rush about something he knew very little about? You see, uh, the heads of government should not get into the nitty-gritty. This is for their ministers and advisors and so and uh, Raji got into the nitty-gritty and uh, at the same time no Prime Minister of India could ignore what was happening in the Indian Ocean and particularly around Sri Lanka. The Americans wanted the Trincomalee base, they wanted a Voice of America thing going up there, Israel was involved, Pakistan, hmm. China, USA, the whole lot but and we couldn't ignore it. But you're saying he should have taken the big picture from a distance which would have given him perspective, yeah. his mistake was A, he got involved in the nitty-gritty mm -hmm. and B, he seemed to be in a rush and being in a rush is always wrong. No, because he thought there was a simple solution available but there was a simple solution and the problem started in uh, Mrs. Gandhi's time. In thinking that there was a simple solution available, was he being simplistic? No, I don't think it was simplistic. I mean, he didn't know the, the hazards and the complications uh, of this issue because the Tamils have been in Sri Lanka for 1500 years. So he didn't realize how hazardous and how complicated the Sri Lanka problem was. Yeah. He was therefore being simplistic in ignoring no, those obstacles. He was generally concerned in finding a solution to the ethnic problem. Now, for instance, you write in your book how the decision to force airdrop of food parcels over Jaffna was taken A, without proper consideration of its implications and consequences and B, without realizing that it was important to forewarn President Jayawardhan of Sri Lanka as well as our own ambassador in the UN who would have had to handle any ramifications and international consequences. That's a pretty damning state of affairs. Explain to me how exactly you came to realize this. Well, I... Um, you see, President Jayawardhan made a statement I think in June of some time saying that uh, Jaffna has to be protected and this is a fight to the finish. Now Rajiv had to react to it. That you know, we are concerned with the uh, fate of the Ramels. Uh, this is a humanitarian problem and this can't go on. But and you were invited when you were at the airport mm. to come and attend a meeting at Racecourse Road where the decision yes. to forcibly airdrop food on Jaffna was being taken. Tell me about that meeting when you walked in. No, I, when I walked in, I just kept quiet because the, the entire uh, hierarchy of government was there. Five members of the polit political affairs committee, the army chief, navy chief, uh, air chief, um, cabinet secretary, foreign secretary, defense secretary, myself, Arun Singh, all the people were there. And what happened? Well, when I asked Raji what's happening, he said that we are planning to uh, airdrop humanitarian aid, medicines and food. And what did you say? So then I, I said, have we informed the Sri Lankan government? So he said, no. So I think it was um, Mr. Shivshankar at the time, I think foreign minister. He said, no, see, what are you talking about? Why should we inform Sri Lanka? So I said, because Sri Lanka is a friendly country, is a small neighbor, is a member of the non land movement, member of the Commonwealth, member of the United Nations, at the moment they are member of the Security Council. And if we do this and they break the uh, airspace of Sri Lanka, they are entitled to the Security Council and there will be a resolution condemning us. So I think it's important we inform our PR in New York 
which you have not done. So Rajiv said, yeah, I get your point, inform Gali Khan. So until you raised this issue, mm. none of the people around Rajiv had alerted him to the need to do these things? I didn't know because I had not had a meeting, but obviously not. So there was a sense in which this meeting was being conducted with impetuosity and haste that is ill-becoming of India. No, I mean, the, 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 it could have been uh, run in a better way. It could have been run in a better way. Yeah. Mm. And then I also asked, uh, have we informed the Sri Lanka High Commissioner in Delhi? We hadn't. So I said, you know, I mean, we must tell him. So Rajiv said, yes, you can tell him, uh, but not before 12 o'clock, mm, tomorrow midday. And uh, this air drop was to take place at 3 o'clock. So I sent for the High Commissioner. Telegraphne, Bernard Telegraphne, and he came to my office, you know, well, fellow, hey, how are you? Yes, that and the other. Just sit down. And I told him what you do. So he's come to his chair and said, You can't, you can't be serious. I said, I'm very serious, inform my president. He said, But I can't get through to him. I said, Use my telephone. And he informed President Jayawardana. In my using presence. the phone in your office. Yeah, I couldn't understand. But I could hear the uh, president shouting. Uh, why the hell didn't you let me know earlier? He said, I didn't know myself. I want to draw the bottom line for the audience. India was planning to transgress Sri Lanka's sovereign airspace at a time when Sri Lanka was a friendly country, a NAM country, a Commonwealth country, and more importantly, a member of the United Nations Security Council where they could have raised a protest mm. without A, informing the Sri Lankan president, without alerting our own man in New York that this would happen so that he could be prepared. In other words, we were violating their airspace without fully working out the consequences or handling the implications. That's right. And that's why I raised these issues and as Rajiv agreed. Now, you also revealed in your book that Rajiv was terribly trusting of Prabhakaran. He had a secret meeting with Prabhakaran, after which you asked Rajiv whether Rajiv had got anything in writing from Prabhakaran, and Rajiv got irritated and said, he's given me his word. Rajiv literally thought that Prabhakaran's word was good enough. But this is where he was a good man. She was a trusting person. And he didn't, why should anybody trick him? Uh, you know, I mean, a hard-boiled politician wouldn't do it. He was not a hard-boiled politician. He was a very decent human being who became prime minister because uh, his mother was assassinated. You call him a decent human being. But was he, in fact, in this instance, naive? No, he was not. As I told you repeatedly, he meant well. He thought he would find a solution for the terrible problem uh, in Sri Lanka. And it was his duty as Prime Minister of India to take every step he could. The truth, and this is pointed out in your book, is that very shortly afterwards Prabhakaran double-crossed Rajiv. Of course he did. You knew Prabhakaran would. Rajiv never realized that. No, he didn't, but he double-crossed our High Commissioner in uh, Sri Lanka. She double-crossed uh, um, uh, everybody in, in, in Sri Lankan government, and he double-crossed uh, the Prime Minister of India. And yet the Prime Minister of India was willing to trust him. No, but because he wanted a solution. So when he was being very difficult, the Prime Minister sent for MGR, the Chief Minister of Sri Lanka, to put some sense into this fellow's head. Now, one of the things your book confirms, although it was suspected for many decades, but your book is the first official confirmation, is that the Indian government bribed Prabhakaran and the LTTE to get them to accept the Indo-Sri Lanka agreement. Yeah, it, uh, there was some, before all this trouble started, some financial help that had been given to them. Now, this was uh, leaked by our High Commissioner in London, uh, in, in Sri Lanka to a correspondent of the observer. Shambhatya. Uh, uh, so when it came out, and I had to speak in Parliament. And uh, I spoke in Parliament, I think, in the month of July 8th or 9th. In your speech in Parliament, you didn't accept this was a bribe. In your speech in Parliament, you explained it away as financial assistance. This is what it was. But in your book, mm. you make it clear it's a bribe. No, I haven't made that. You said, in fact, only one installment was paid because the LTT thereafter was at war with the IPKF. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, this was financially given to them because we thought it necessary that they might turn them around. It was not a bribe, it was a political decision to take. In your book it's perfectly clear it's a bribe. Now in this interview you're saying no, something I'm, else. I, I'm sorry, I've not said this is a bribe. Was this money paid by the government or was it paid on behalf of the government by RAW? Well, there are, there are agencies which do this kind of thing. So RAW could have paid the money? I mean, I mean you know, I mean, if, if you've not been in government you wouldn't know. If you're in government you would know how this is done. All right.
I'm just going to underline for the audience that what you're saying today in this interview is a little different from what you clearly suggest in your book, but that's your prerogative to change your position in the book. No, it's I don't think clear. I am. I don't think I am. Well, people will read the book and discover for themselves, but let's no, leave that aside. I have aside. not used the word bribe anywhere. No, you haven't used the word bribe, yes, but it's quite yes. clear that's what it was. No, no, that's what you conclude. I don't conclude. All right. Yeah. You're being a diplomat suddenly, yeah. and I can understand there are yeah. national interests at stake over here. Yeah. Something else that your book reveals, and perhaps it's particularly shocking, is how the decision to send the Indian army into Sri Lanka was taken. Yeah. You say the decision was taken at an afternoon reception at the home of the Sri Lankan president in Colombo, that Rajiv Gandhi took the decision without consulting his cabinet ministers, leave aside top officials in Delhi. Mm. Why do you think Rajiv Gandhi took such a critical decision in such a casual and cavalier way? Well, you know, we had Pivi um, Narsana um, um, also with us at, at, at this, uh, when we went to Colombo for signing the agreement. Because uh, the previous month we had dropped and um, violated their airspace. After one month there was a U-turn to have an agreement because the LTT had been cornered. So they touched, got in contact with Anne Ram, Hindu and Singapore. Right, right. So, you, so Narsimha Rao was with you in Colombo uh, at that reception. Tell me what happened. So when we were having dinner, then we, we saw the Prime Minister was, you know, surrounded by a number of people from our uh, 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 officials and uh, Sri Lankan officials and the President Javan were also there. So uh, PV said, you go and find out. I said, no, please, you go. You are the cabinet minister. You go. I went and so I said, sir, can I have a minute with you? I said, what's happening? He said, the President has said that there will be a coup tonight, and this country is already burning, and I need your help. And unless the help arrives immediately, uh, this situation will completely out of control, and I can't control it. So Rajiv has in, uh, instructed that the troops should be free. So Rajiv had already given instructions? Yep. So the instructions to call out Indian troops had already been given before you went up to Rajiv to ask what's happening? That's what, and that's what you told me that I've already done so. You must and have and uh, uh, you read Dixon's book, Assignment Colombo, it's there in great detail. Now, you say of the IPKF mission, the IPKF went in without clear briefings or objectives, neither were the troops told about the geography of the Jaffna Peninsula, mm -hmm. nor about the LTTE hideouts. Mm -hmm. In other words, what you're saying is that the IPKF was not prepared for what they were undertaking. Yes, yeah, sure. Repeat that again? Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah clear as day and you read uh, Dixie's book who was there on the spot and I am telling you we lost 15,000 people in, in Sri Lanka and those were unnecessary were, deaths yes because there was no co coherence in our policy six instrumentalities were dealing uh, the Prime Minister's Office, the External Affairs, the Defence Ministry, the Air Ministry uh, RAW, IB, CBI and Mr. MGR, Mr. MGR had uh, his own Tamil Nadu Sri Lanka policy. India had uh, its own. So there was confusion all the time and Prabhakaran's people intercepting, intercepting all our messages. In fact, at one point of time, President Jai Vardhana jokes to you about these multiple Indian agencies mm -hmm. trying to handle Sri Lanka. What did he say? What was the joke? No, he, he asked the, the um, our Admiral Dixit. Yeah, how many policies do you have for Sri Lanka? And then the, you change your interlocutors every few months. And then he named them. Did he not say, I must be the Sunil Gavaskar of politics because you sent six interlocutors to bowl me out and I keep batting and they lose instead? This is what uh, Dixit told me. Dixit, the, the High Commissioner, told you this? Yeah, this story. I wouldn't have known as my job. You were Minister of State for External Affairs at the time of the IPKS. This is your conclusion about the whole Sri Lanka operation. You say from the very beginning, the Sri Lanka ethnic issue was mishandled and ended as a complete failure. That's a damning verdict. Not only that, it ended in the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi. Because by 91, it was clear that Rajiv was coming back. And Prabhakaran knew that he would go for him. This is the reason why Rajiv Gandhi lost. How him. much of the blame and responsibility for this complete failure, as you call it, vests with Rajiv Gandhi? All of us. But he was Prime Minister. That's all right. We were his advisors. Are you suddenly protecting him? No, I'm not. I'm telling him the truth. Doesn't the captain of the team face the biggest responsibility when there's a debacle? Certainly he does. 
So and then the biggest share is no, Rajiv Gandhi. No, no, they are, the officials advised him. Uh, Dixit in his book says, you know, the advice was wrong. He is one of the principal advisors. Mm -hmm. So you insist that you can't single out Rajiv Gandhi for the lion's share of the blame for the mishandling of the Sri Lanka adventure and the IPK. If you insist on that. Yeah, I do. Now, what your book says about Operation Brass Tax, and that was another controversy when Rajiv Gandhi was Prime Minister, is very similar to what you suggest about IPK. If you say Brass Tax was cooked up by the then Defence Minister of State Arun Singh mm. and the then Army Chief General Sundarji, and Rajiv Gandhi had no knowledge of it. Mm. Are you absolutely serious that the Prime Minister was in the dark? Well, he rang me up uh, on the racks. What are you doing? I said, I'm doing nothing. Like, Come along, we are about to go to war with Pakistan. So I arrived and uh, sat in his car to go to the airport and Sonia was also in the car and then he said, uh, I said, you, told, you said to me that we're going to war. I said, external affairs know nothing about it. He said, but I also don't know. But I said, you're a defense minister. But I've been kept in the dark by uh, my minister of state and the army chief. He actually admitted to you That's right. that as both PM and defense minister he had been kept in the dark. That's right. He had no knowledge of brass tax. That's what he said. Even though the Pakistanis thought that brass tax was an attempt to invade. That's what they thought. So I said, let's find out if there is any movement on the Pakistan side. And I suggested to him that Tiwariji, who was the foreign minister, and I called the American and the um, Russian ambassadors. He would call the American, I called the Russian, and ask them every six hours if there is any movement. And they said, 18 hours, no movement, after there is a movement. So we took this conclusion. Uh, Tiwariji and May to uh, the Prime Minister and said this and they were Arun Singh who said no this information is not correct. Arun Singh disputed the information you had got from American and Russian that's, satellites. That's right, yeah. Arun Singh therefore was in a sense carrying on his own defense policy. Whatever he was but this is what he said. So and he was accompanied by uh, General Sundar, uh, General Hazari. Let me point this out to you. As I listen to what you say about IPKF and Rajiv's role and Rajiv's handling of it, particularly his trust of Prabhakaran, particularly the cavalier and way in which the decision to send Indian troops was taken, mm -hmm. the manner in which he decided to airdrop without even thinking of the consequences. Mm -hmm. And then when I listen to what you say about brass tax mm -hmm. and the fact that he had no idea what was happening, no, no, I, used, I uh, come to the conclusion no, no, I, that Rajiv Gandhi was perhaps a little incompetent. No, no, that's your conclusion, not my conclusion. Uh, he was not incompetent. He worked very hard. As you, when you come to the China story, I will tell you what happened there. What it happened was that he was so trusting a human being. A politician shouldn't be that trusting. But he was not a run-of-the-mill politician. Isn't too much trusting a lapse in a politician? I think it is if you, are, you practice real politics. But India has not practiced real politics from the beginning. But Rajiv was in a sense faced with the situation where real politics was essential, particularly when you talk about brass tax, particularly when you talk about IPK. In those circumstances, to be trusting surely is a lapse, a serious lapse. No, no, we are all to blame for it. And similarly in the brass tax thing, all right. then he asked me after um, Arun Singh and others, Hazari had withdrawn, and he asked Tewariji to, and me to stay back, and he asked Tewariji, what do I do with my Minister of State of Defense? So uh, Tiwariji looked at me, so I said, uh, sack him. And the Prime Minister said, but he's a friend. So I said, uh, sir, you are no longer the president of the do Old Boys Association of Do School. You're the Prime Minister of India. Prime Minister no friends. So the advice to sack Arun Singh first came from you? Yeah, I said, you should. Let's come to China. Hmm. It was Rajiv Gandhi's great foreign trip. It was probably the highlight in terms of his foreign policy achievements. Yes, right. yes. But your book reveals that he actually made a terrible faux pas. He went to meet Deng Xiaoping, but forgot to take the foreign secretary and India's ambassador in Beijing. That's very minor. It doesn't involve any policy decision. I'll come to it. You see, for China, he prepared for six to eight months. He had the briefs on his fingertips. And there was serious opposition from the right wing of the Congress party undertaking this trip. And P. V. Lasa told me, Kya kar rahe ho? why are you taking there? We are having elections. I said, listen, we are a six and seven with Pakistan, with the USA in China. What do you expect the diplomats to do? So I said the same to Rajiv Gandhi. So he said, I said, start with China. You have Jawaharlal Nehru's grandson, you have 413 MPs, you have Indira Gandhi's 
Son, who's going to question that you sell out? So Rajiv Gandhi accepted your advice. That's right. That a visit to China yep. to improve relations with this country was a credible and critical way of the Indian Prime Minister behaving. Yeah, and it was overdue. I and you're saying he prepared meticulously for he this? He did absolutely meticulously because after all, you are going to discuss it with Chen Xiaoping, who would be in one of the most senior leaders of the Communist Party. Did he Pakistan? prepare for the China visit more than he did for any of his other visits? As far as I know, he did. So uh, on the Commonwealth visits also. For uh, I remember he took on Mrs. Thatcher at Vancouver. But the China visit is one that stands out in your memory. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, when he went to Beijing. The high point was his meeting with Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. Deng Xiaoping was the man who ruled China. Absolutely. Rajiv took Gopi Arora, the secretary in the PMO, mm -hmm. with him. But he didn't take the foreign secretary and he didn't take India's ambassador. Mm. Yeah. And then he realized that uh, the, he had, made, he had uh, uh, heard. And then she told me that, you know, I've made a gaffe. Uh, he admitted this to you? Oh, he told me. Uh, I believe. So I said, he said, what do you do? I said, send for KBS man. He who said, was the foreign secretary? Yeah. No, no Prime Minister would have bothered to send for the Foreign Secretary. He did. And what did he say to KPS? He said, uh, this is a mistake. Now you come to all the meetings. And he needed a big heart for it. And the Prime Minister don't care for uh, ambassador or Foreign Secretaries. This is very different to the way Rajiv Gandhi treated A.P. Venkateshwaran, who was in fact, I believe, KPS Menon's predecessor as Foreign Secretary. Venkateshwaran was sacked at a public meeting in a summary manner. In the case of K.P. Smenon, Rajiv Gandhi accepted he'd made a mistake and mm -hmm. apologized. Mm -hmm. He apologized. So he said, I regret this, this very much. I regret it. And did K.P. Smenon accept? Of course, immediately. Let's come to the sort of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi was and the way he handled his office. His first 18 months were perhaps a period of unprecedented popularity. Yet you say of that particular period, for the first 18 months of his prime ministership, Rajiv Gandhi depended wholly on a team of ignoramuses with inflated egos. They were bright but brash. One claimed to be a socialist, whilst one was an inept political wheeler dealer. A third was a meddling nuisance. Collectively, they were an irresponsible group that showed little regard for senior Congress ministers and government rules and regulations. And you add, they dented Rajiv Gandhi's prestige and his image. Well, first of all, who were these three men? Two are dead. Oh, well, never mind, who are they? Yeah, and uh, there's uh, Gopi Arora and uh, Arun Nehru. Those yeah. are the two who are dead? Yeah, they're dead. And there's one who's still alive, and I don't want to name him. He's a dear old man, yeah. Mm. Is that mm. Arun Singh by any chance? No, I'm not talking about it. Well, no, they, oh. no, I won't, no, I won't name him. It's not Arun Singh. No. Mm. Why won't you name him? Because, you know, he's a very, very old man and I've known him for so long and I don't you, think I do. You said to me yesterday in part one of this interview mm. that you had a duty to tell the full facts, that you couldn't therefore withhold this knowledge that Sonia Gandhi refused the prime ministership not because her inner voice mm -hmm. spoke to her but because her son was scared. Mm. You felt a duty to reveal that. Mm. Don't you feel a similar duty to reveal the name of this person whether he's alive or dead? It's not that important. Well, that's for others to judge. Why? Because in judging it, you're coming to an editorial decision of protecting an individual when you consciously chose not to protect Sonia and that story. This is the least I can do is to protect the wonderful Prime Minister and a wonderful human being. But we're not talking about the Prime Minister, we're talking about someone who is either a meddlesome nuisance or an ignoramus yes, they are, who they misled are. the Prime no, Minister. he agreed to it. I remember when he went to Harare for the... No, no, but name this person. Why aren't you not mm. naming him? No, I'd rather not. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd rather not. Even though people will accuse you of hypocrisy? They are most welcome to, they, in any case they will. Sonia Gandhi will turn around and say there are double standards. He revealed my story even though I personally met him mm. in May to ask him yeah, not to. Yeah. Yet he hides the name of a person who he deliberately calls an ignoramus and who he says damaged and dented Raji's image. And yet you are protecting this person. In the, in the context of the larger picture of India, government of India, this is a very minor incident. You oh. can't compare it with anything by Sonia. This is a very, very minor incident. All right, let's come to what you say about the two Arun, Arun Heru and Arun Singh. Mm. You say they wielded much power, exceeded their authority, and used their influence and with thoughtless rigor, mm. without care or caution. Both controlled access to the Prime Minister, 
their administrative experience was nil, they were purblind to the complexities and intricacies of government. You make it seem as if Rajiv Gandhi was a puppet in the hands of the no, Dwarves. You see, he had not been in politics. He had not been in government. These are the people he knew. He didn't know any of the bureaucrats, any of the foreign service officers. So he depended on them in good faith. Then he realized and they both were sacked. Uh, he told me in 19, October 1956 at Harare that he was going to sack Arun Nehru. And he did. And then uh, already Arun Singh had been sacked earlier in the year. You know, you explain it on the grounds that he was new. He didn't understand government, mm -hmm. so he relied on his friends. But when you're Prime Minister of India, that's either naive it, or it suggests that you have no way of performing your duty as Prime Minister in a credible way. Instead, you're doing it with chums and old buddies around you. No, this was the early part of it. And uh, uh, anybody who... No, I remember uh, Ms. Indira Gandhi. She had gone with her father for 17 years. She was Congress President. But the first two years were very difficult for her. It's only after she eliminated the syndicate that she, she was very nervous in Parliament. Okay. We had to... You're saying Rajiv went through something very similar in yeah, his first yeah, two years. Yes. Let me put this to you. One of the inescapable conclusions one comes to is that Rajiv Gandhi may have been a good and likable human being, but he was a pretty poor politician and somewhat inept as Prime Minister. Well, you see, A, China is not inept. Number two, Forgetting to take your foreign secretary is pretty silly. No, it is not. It's very minor. It's very minor administrative matter. Can't it's be that minor because he apologized. Absolutely minor. It's very. It is a decency. <laughs> no other prime minister have done it. He said to hell with the foreign secretary. Is, I had, I've done it. I've done it. Oh. So you're saying to me hmm. that this impression that I have from your book and from this interview, hmm? that Rajiv may have been a good and likable man, but he was a poor politician and perhaps an inept prime minister, you're saying that impression is wrong. No, I have not said that in my book. I have not used this language. No, you yeah. haven't used that language, but yeah. that's the clear impression your book gives. But this gives it to you, it doesn't give it to me. It'll give it to hundreds of millions of no, others who read the book. How can you speak for hundreds of millions of people? What I don't understand mm. is this. Mm. Are you simply denying to accept the obvious impression your book creates about Rajiv Gandhi? Or is it that you are so fond of Rajiv Gandhi that you don't want to accept what stares other people in the face? I am responsible to myself, not to you or to the millions of people in India. I get the clear impression that you are far more fond of Rajiv and far more loyal and protective of him than you are of Sonia Gandhi. Because he didn't behave like his wife did. That makes the big difference. Yeah. In dropping you the way she did and treating you the way she did, she snapped the relationship. He would have never done it, neither Indira Gandhi nor Jawaharlal Nehru. But Sonia did. No, she did. Where does this ruthlessness in Sonia come from? You ask her. No, you must know. No, but you ask her. You but ask you've known her question. for 50 years. Yeah, I don't have yeah, access yeah, yeah, to her. Yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. You're making it clear. To some extent, for a leader it is necessary. And this is where uh, uh, Rajiv defaulted. He was too trusting of people. You know, you just now said, Rajiv would not have treated you like this. Indra would not mm -hmm. have treated you like mm -hmm. this. Jawaharlal Nehru would yep. not have treated you like this. In your book you say, no Indian would have treated me like that. True. I meant, I'll repeat it to you. Is this ruthlessness part of Sonia's Italian background? It could be. Because no Indian would treat a man who had been loyal to the family for 45 years, who had been very, very close to her, who was 30 years older than her, to treat him like this, no Indian would do. Neither Rajiv, nor Indra Gandhi, nor Jawaharlal Nehru, or any other leader. It's just not done in India. So like this, it, this is the point at which Sonia Gandhi clearly shows she's not originally Indian. Some part of not Indian. She was not born in India. Uh, although she adopted India, uh, she behaves like an Indian, she dresses like an Indian, but there is a part uh, which is ruthless. And that's the Italian part of Sonia. What else can it be? I believe this is something you mentioned to Priyanka Gandhi when you met her on the 7th of May, didn't you? Hmm. That's yes? Yes, I did. You actually pointed out to Priyanka that this ruthlessness that hmm. Sonia had shown hmm. was the Italian side of her. I didn't say that. What did you say? I said, this is it. 
And what did Priyanka reply? Because what she replied, I will not tell you. Is it not the case that Priyanka smiled and said, this is the Italian side of my no, mother? I, I don't confirm this. You don't confirm it? No. The I important thing is you don't deny it. No, I don't deny it. I don't confirm it. I mean, you can reach your That's own That's good enough for me. You don't confirm, you don't deny. Yeah, you can con to your own conclusion. And I'll remind the audience, you're a man who believes that facts should not be withheld. Yeah. As a historian, you believe the world should know not the truth. Not facts, truth. My last question to you. Mm. Many people are going to look at your book and say, what makes this book important is what he said about Rajiv and Sonia, the new image he's created of them, and the way some nasty people will say he's brought them down a peg or two. Are you happy or sad that your book will be remembered because of the way it portrays Rajiv and Sonia? Why it portrays Indira Gandhi, the Jawaharlal Nehru, so many other people? They're dead and gone and yeah. forgotten. Rajiv and Sonia are very much around, no, no, one in no, person, no, the other, no, no, very much in the spirit of the Congress. Yeah, that's the tragedy because we don't have any sense of history. Jawaharlal Nehru was a very, very great man, very good prime minister, was a poor foreign minister. Do you stand by everything in your book about Rajiv and Sonia? Yes, I do. There's no question if you're withdrawing it. Why should I be right? There's no question of her saying I got my facts or my dates or my conversations if wrong. If anybody say the dates are wrong, I'd be say I'll correct them. But the facts are correct. Yeah, of course they are. It's I can't. Well, why do you think I should make them up? It's an for saying. Hmm. For being so open and so frank, and I should add for the audience, for going way beyond what you've actually put in your book. Because there's a lot that you said to me that's not in your book. I'm deeply grateful. And I'll repeat for the audience the most important thing that is new in this interview. That when Sonia Gandhi came to meet you on May the 7th, she apologized. She embraced you. She said you were once her closest friend. That she had told you things she's never told her children. None of that is in your book. It's revealed for the first time in this interview. But in particular, it was revealed yesterday in part one. I thank you very much for being so open. History will judge how your book will go down, how your revelations will be taken, and whether people will think you've been fair, or whether you've been vindictive and vengeful. But I'm grateful that you've spoken so openly to me.